Hello and welcome to the Let's Talk Transformation podcast. Uh, today's episode, we will be discussing inclusion and creating the conditions in organizations for people to thrive. I am delighted to welcome Jody Jarvis, certified business psychologist and also human performance specialist to create high reliability organizations. Jody, welcome to the show. Hello, Susie. Hello, everybody. Jody, I know you spend your time uh, working on promoting and trying to create a culture of safety in organizations, um, not just to create a culture of safety, but so that people can thrive and learn, irrespective of their background, their profile, their seniority, etc., which is a quest we share in terms of having an open and more level playing field to create more inclusive and essentially collaborative workplaces. What started your interest in that subject of creating this type of workplace and more particularly around neurodiversity? I think for me, the the challenges of inclusion have been quite apparent for me um, throughout my entire career, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So inclusion is about, you know, building an environment where, you know, everybody, everybody's voice is heard, everybody's valued, that they can bring the best of themselves to the table and that the organisation can benefit from that. So. Mm -hmm. Inclusion is essential for for performance, really, on a, both an individual and a, an organisational level. Mm. Um, I think from a neurodiversity perspective, the reason that I am interested in all of this is because I suppose I've had challenges throughout my sort of life and my career because my brain's slightly different to a lot of the people. Okay. Um, I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was seventeen. It was quite a date, a, a quite a late diagnosis. So yeah. essentially, I struggled quite a lot up until that point. Um, and I know what it feels like to be discriminated against or made to feel like you're a bit stupid just because you don't think the same way mm. as others you might have a different way of doing things mm. a different way of learning um because essentially throughout school I'd had lots of school reports and feedback that she doesn't try hard enough she's always yeah. distracted she's not very good at this she's not very good at that mm. um, and there was never any acknowledgement of actually she's trying really hard but this just isn't working for her and mm. um, I think we've got a lot more awareness around that now both on a, an organizational level and on a societal level you know even schools are a lot more sort of open and aware and um, but when I grew up that wasn't the case and um, so that was where I got into psychology if you like right and trying to understand what it was I needed on an individual level to thrive which was something that was sometimes a bit different to other people or at least other people could thrive in an environment where I wasn't so much. What I do think is that whatever it is that I have identified as needing as an individual, whether that's, you know, um, a clear instruction or clear feedback or whatever it might be, um, is beneficial for everybody. So it's whatever we do for neurodivergent people, actually everybody benefits from it because everybody wants clearer communication. Mm. Everybody wants a more inclusive workplace, um, more flexibility and all of these things that we need to thrive. So it benefits everybody. There's nothing that can happen by trying to help the neurodiversity, uh, the neurodivergent community that can be detrimental for other people. It's all beneficial for everybody. That's how I sort of see it. Mm. Uh, but as I've gone, so that was psychology. That's how I got into psychology is through understanding and wanting to understand more about mm. my own brain. Um, and then as I was working in various organisations, um, I came to to realize that you know inclusion is essential for safety. Um, and then I was a pregnant woman who experienced some elements of discrimination through that as well and missed out mm. on job opportunities and things. Then I'm I'm now a working mum. So inclusion has been important for me on many different levels for many yep. different reasons until this point in my career. So I truly believe that you know diversity improves organizational performance. Mm. We need people to think differently. We need people to share viewpoints and perspectives so that we have the creativity and the innovation to do things differently and do mm. things better. Mm. And so if we don't create that for our people, well, they'll either go somewhere else that does um, or we'll miss out on them. And it's a shame. Mm. And I think it's really interesting because your whole story, um, the first step is making it conscious for yourself and then formalising it, naming it for yourself which sparked your curiosity to go and, you know, research a bit more and to look at other levers. Um, do you think that in the workplace today, so you're now, um, you have fluency, let's say, in how in what you need, why you need it and how you explain it. How do people react to that? Because formalising it is one thing, but the other person has to be able to manage or deal with 
whatever you've put on their table type of thing? I think people can find the whole umbrella term of diversity and inclusion quite overwhelming. Yeah. They're not sure what to do with it. They're not sure what they can do on an individual level. So it just kind of ends up being something that is spoken about, but no, no real action is taken. And I think that one thing I try to do um, when I'm talking to to anybody, any especially like sort of senior leaders about what it is that we can do differently, it's it's about understanding what our people need. And really, that's all about listening. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we jump to direction and um, guidance and outcomes and performance when we mm. when we lead people a lot of the time and that connection that mm. needs to happen first is missed so I think if we can use a framework in our organizations where we connect then lead mm. we'll set ourselves up for better success so especially when you have somebody new come into your organization or into your team understanding what works for them who are these people mm. what do they need exactly to thrive and how can you best help them with that and, and set them up for success mm. I think if we go straight in with feedback loops and here's what I need from you it's a bit mm. like well hang on a second that's not I don't know if that's going to work for me so can we work together on finding a way forward you know collaboratively mm. um and I think from an inclusion perspective you don't know what you're getting sometimes when you employ people and often it takes honest conscious conversation to try and delve into oh right this person actually struggles in this part of their life or their work so maybe I can offer extra support with this you'd mm. never have known that if you didn't enter in those kinds of conversations yeah. so there's definitely something in needing to upskill people to have that not it's not necessarily emotional intelligence because often people will notice that there's a problem but they don't know how to react and respond yeah. Yeah. so it's 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 actually giving people the skills needed to meet the, the needs of, of the people that they're employing essentially mm, mm. ask the right questions get the answers and then actually take action to help mm. it's about um, giving the skills for them to have those conversations though jody isn't it and, and for exactly, them to yeah. step out of our our uh, reflexes so organizational reflex to do and fix and deliver and the human brain and i'd be interested in your input on this because this is my uh, go-to thing the reflex of our brains to give advice so when we're not comfortable, we need to fix it, give it a solution and get, and it's the advice monster thing, isn't it? Of, oh yeah, I I can tell you how to do that. I can help you with that. As opposed to leaving a space where the person can actually express, maybe they just want to be heard. Absolutely. And I think there's so much in that. It's, it's, it's getting comfortable with discomfort, isn't it? Yeah. You have conversations yeah. where people reveal things to you. And I think, you know, this goes through into our, into our personal and private lives as well, when it comes to mental health. Of course. I think there is an element of people not speaking enough. Yeah. But I do think that there is a lot around people who do talk. They do share. They're saying I'm not OK. But people don't know how to help them. They don't know how to respond, how to change that. And I think that this goes this goes through and through to the to the bigger picture of the context that's driving mental health issues in our society and in our organizations, mm. because focusing on the person and what they need to do differently it is is one thing and it can be beneficial in some circumstances but often if we constantly focus on what the person needs to do differently we miss the wider context of what is driving mental health in so many different people mm. there's a wider issue here that we need mm. to look at mm. um you know the pressures of life are just a bit too much yeah you know um yeah. And that kind of links in with with the inclusion part as well about being a working mom and probably mm. always having this higher pressure like a a, a a mental workload that's so much more than than perhaps and not necessarily only for working mums but you know what I'm saying like the workload is not always equal no even if it's equal at work no. there's work outside of the organizational context that impacts mm. people's mental health mm. and I think so since COVID particularly I'm hearing a lot more around D and I, and then there's this backlash around around the fact that the dialogue's been opened, and you know, and and also the same around mental health. Um, I'm not sure, Jody, that we're actually um, getting to the point that you have just made so eloquently, which is, we need what what levers can we use, and how do we equip people to actually talk about this subject? Because it's it's the dialogue is now open, but I'm worried that it will become a checklist of, we've trained everyone on mental health, uh, they all understand what this is, uh, they all understand the differences in terms of neurodiverse people, and so what? 
Um, and, and I think it doesn't necessarily equip them to have the conversations that you were talking about at the beginning. What, what do you think about that? And what do you see as the levers in organizations? Clearly, there's an individual part to that, me as a leader, what's my agency, but also as a, a collective, what can we do? Um, I think it's all rooted in sort of empathy and trying to understand from a, from the person's perspective how they are feeling and how it's impacting them on an individual basis. And I think mm -hmm. as individual leaders, I like this, you know, we've, we've often got these, cult we, we've got cultures of, of care and, and we want to be supportive and we want to provide this context where people feel cared for and supported. But what do we really mean by that? I think that's the challenge. If I, had, if I had an answer to your question, I think I'd, I'd probably be a billionaire because yeah, I'd absolutely. be able to <laughs> all organisations' problems. But what do we really mean when we talk about care? Because we say we want a culture of, we want a culture where we care for our people. That's all well and good, but care might be something very different for one person as opposed to the other. How care looks to me might be very different to how care looks to my colleague. Mm. So, what do we mean by that? And, and again, going back to individual relationships. If as a line manager, you don't know who's working for you, and by know them, I mean really know them, how can you help them thrive and provide what you're asking of them in the workplace? So it all boils down, I think, to connection and relationships. And that goes all the way through to our society, that if you haven't got the connections and the support network needed to help you be okay, that's where things start to immediately fail. And then you take that into the workplace with you as well. Mm. So it all comes back to creating these really strong relationships throughout your life. And what does that come back to? Well, it comes to being able to have difficult conversations when, when they need to happen without hurting people, mm. you know, feedback, being able to the same things that we need from leaders. We need it in our personal lives as well. So I think there is, there is a lot of, um reflection and need for personal growth within mm. leadership so mm. what can i do as a leader to help others so i've come across in my career a lot of of mindsets that are quite fixed so yeah. this is just the way i am um, you can expect me to be like this with you um and for me that's not an inclusive mentality no. that's not an adaptable mindset where you're going to be able to create an inclusive workplace for people mm. if you can't look inside yourself and do work on you and what you need to do differently to be more inclusive it's really difficult for you to drive an inclusive workplace or culture isn't mm. it mm. so it starts with us as individuals and our willingness to look inside and say right this isn't working i'm causing harm mm. I'm impacting the well-being of, of people. I need to do things differently. I need to approach conversations in a different way mm. rather than saying this is just the way I am. And I, I, just, I, I refuse to believe that that's something that we should be accepting at a senior leadership level, especially. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting. I was having this discussion yesterday um, around, we call it personal development, and you're right, it's an inside-out job leadership uh, and it starts with you and you have to you have to have a look inside and stuff. But it's being a leader is not about you, is it? It's about other people and the, exactly, the collective, yeah. the way you lead. Yeah. So for me, there's a massive disconnect today in the way we frame learning and development and personal development and what we're asking of leaders, particularly in a more sort of interconnected environment. And if I put the hybrid model in there, um, being inclusive can look quite different in a virtual way or require different skills leadership skills in a virtual sense than it can in um in a face-to-face -face environment so, so i mean what are your thoughts on how um how people can make sure that they remain inclusive in their leadership practices in a hybrid model jody what's your, what's your experience around that i think you have to make extra effort to connect and to have one-to-one -one conversations and um to understand how things are impacting people on a personal level. So I've seen lots of, um, you know, people trying to do this. So mm. bringing teams together to have discussions openly amongst each other. But I think there is something about really drilling in on an individual level with the people that work for you, what's working for you, what isn't, and not just at a work level, but understanding what their challenges are in the background as well, at home, 
mm. and and what could impact them and what could impact their work. And I think again, it's it's that relationship building, getting to know, getting to understand, helping to create, if you can, tailor made mm. ways of working for individuals, mm. because that's kind of what we all want. We want people to see us, to understand us, to know us on a on a personal level. Mm. Um, and I think if you can get to that point, you are doing so much better than than mm. most teams. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that that can help. Um, ask me the question again. <laughs> Was around how how can they remain inclusive in their leadership practices in a hybrid environment? Oh, in a hybrid environment, right? Yeah. So with regards to having t- some people working from home and some people mm. in the office, if you can create. Um, days that you bring the team together whether that's face-to-face or whether that's all on Mm. online and you have that community you have that sense of connection restored so team away days are a great way to do this Mm. we're always talking about work at work we don't have time to talk about anything else Mm. so take people out of the work environment and go and do an away day Mm. where everybody can attend something that works for everybody um where you can have conversations that get to know we get to know each other and we build trust on a on a sort of individual level mm. that then cascades into a team level where you get better psychological safety where people feel able to you know talk and share mm. information mm. so i think you can set your team up for success if you put the time in and you invest in getting them out of the mm. the workplace environment doing mm. team related exercises mm. and then you know whatever works for an individual if they want to if they want to work on teams for their one to ones let them do that if yeah. they want to work face-to-face for their one-to-ones, let them do that. So I think mm. it's just about being flexible as a leader. Mm. Um, and and the, 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 the communication needs to be more proactive and more deliberate, of course, if it's a hybrid model and you're working from home a lot more because you mm. don't have those sort of sidewalk conversations, no. those sort of, sorry, corridor conversations where you might pick up on somebody not being okay. Mm. You don't get that opportunity. So it's really it's, it's extra effort. Yeah, it's really interesting, your, the use of the word flexible, that was going to be my next question around flexible working, because, um, and I'm going to come back to women in the workplace, um, because flexible working was an advantage that came from COVID, the fact that, you know, we saw a lot more opportunities of how we could work flexibly as teams than we, than we did beforehand. Uh, but I've also seen quite, and this was a question I asked myself and lots of different leaders during COVID of, how much on a scale of one to five do you think your organization is going to learn the lessons of COVID, of what's happening? How much is it going to change the way it behaves and the way it manages its people? And the outcome wasn't, <laughs> the score they gave me wasn't particularly optimistic. And I see quite a lot of, oh, we do flexible working now, we've got a four day week tick. Or we do flexible working now, everybody has to, emphasis on has to, come in three days a week. Tick. So, where flexible working as it first came in, I thought during COVID, I thought this could level the playing field for women. Uh, I think that is not necessarily the case. And best case scenario, it has leveled it for some women, but it, we're still not hitting the majority. What are your thoughts on that? It's definitely helped to level the playing field, but I think there are a few implications that have come in as a consequence. So one would be that women are under pressure to have it all yeah. you know this whole manage work manage children do it all it, you can have it all is the, is the narrative so do it do it all flexible working just helps to reinforce that even more that look it's possible because you can now you can work flexibly but time is time and yeah. if you're working a 40 hour work week whether you're doing that around your children whether you're doing that in the evenings in the mornings or however flexible you're working if you're working 40 hours at some point in your week you've got to find those 40 hours, 40 hours. yeah right. um in the same way that if you want to be a present parent you want to be there for drop off and pick up and you want to do teas and bedtimes and you know you you don't want to spend your weekends working how are you going to find those hours it, you have to have for me, a really strong support network around you to be able to make that happen, whether it's paid support or whether it's, you know, family support. And not everybody has that. So it's a challenge, again, on an individualistic level Mm. that some people will be able to help. This will help some people, it will help most people. I think flexible work is the best thing that's ever happened to me because for me, the, the, the choice is not, you know, flexible working or 
normal working it's flexible working or don't work at all yeah. yes you know, yeah. or take a massive salary cut because you can't mm. work in full hours mm. so for me it's essential um, and if I can't get that from the business that I work with I would have to go and work for somebody else and that's kind of the the realistic mm. challenge I think businesses are facing is that if they can't provide this flexibility people will go and find it somewhere else mm. Mm. but I think there's also something around um you know, at the moment, I'm hearing a lot more about schools wanting to do free wraparound care. So you would be able to drop your kids off at eight and you'd be able to pick them up at, say, six and it wouldn't cost any more. And that would be incorporated into the, the school day, essentially, mm. Friday. Now, that's great. But for me, it misses the point. I don't want my kids to be away from me for longer. That's to. not the mm. point. The point is I want to be present for them as much as I can around my work. And let me get it straight that my kids usually come second in my priorities. They do I, because they are the ones that can bend and bow and be flexible for me. My work is sometimes more rigid that deadlines have to be met. Mm. So, yeah, sometimes I have mm. to put my children second to my work, you know, as much as as much as I can. I put them first. But then mm. then it's like, well, I can't pick the kids up today, so somebody else is going to have to do it. And that's kind of how it works, because they're the ones that, yep. that will flex or can flex um, to an extent. But, yeah, the, the point is that I think we're missing the point. Women do not need flexible working because they have this burden of being there for their kids. It's they want to be there for their kids. Mm. So it, it it's important for my mental health yep. that I do the, the pick up. Yeah. that I'm there for my daughter when she first finishes her, her new mm. school year, you know, mm. when she's, she's starting school um, in September, when she finishes her first few days, I want to be there to pick her up. And that's important for me. And if I miss that, that's going to have an impact on my well-being. So having wraparound care is not really going to help that. It's just going to create more segregation, more distance between me and my children, which will impact my relationships at home. Mm -hmm. I'll probably put a lot more pressure on me and my husband. My kids will be more needy when I am there, which, yeah. more, which makes it more difficult mm -hmm. for me to then manage work. So there's so many implications here. And I think a lot of the time that especially people who are working in senior levels of organisations that maybe they had their kids a long time ago or they haven't had kids, they don't understand that a last minute change of schedule doesn't impact only me, it impacts my entire family, system. my children's expectations that I was going to be there to pick them up and now I'm not, or I was going to be there for bedtime and now I'm not. It's It has a huge cascade of, of impact. Mm. So, But then on the, in the same breath, I think organisations often appreciate that that could be the case and therefore it makes it difficult to employ working mums, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because they know that this kind of thing is the balance that they need to try and and, and create space for. Mm. So that's also a challenge. And I know when I was experiencing what I, you know, the closest thing I've come to being discriminated against when I was pregnant, you know, going through um, interview processes and knowing that, that I was a really good candidate because of the feedback I got and, you mm. know, but then realizing that I was pregnant and withdrawing an offer or, you know, not, well, not giving me an mm. offer and telling me, oh, do you know what, but this other role that's coming up in six months time might be a really good fit for you. And that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. But what's driving that is something different is I don't believe that that is discrimination because I'm a woman necessarily. It's because yes. they are in a difficult situation of not knowing how to manage that from a business resources perspective. Because if they bring me in, I'm going to go off work in in six months and I'm going mm. to have a baby for nine, nine months to a year. So how are they going to cover that gap? So until we provide organizations with the resources and the, the support they need, the, the culture that's required to say, we're going to make this work no matter what, how are individuals expected to, to take that on? Mm. You know, they need to get work done and it's challenging for them. It is. And it's still very much a burden for the woman because in majority of cases it's the woman doing that however we have opened a dialogue thanks covid as well within society and therefore within organizations around men uh doing shared care and leaving early early have you seen my bias leaving early leaving at the time they need to leave um no, to go and pick up their children um or whatever or or go and see their parents if they're carers or, or whatever so i think it's interesting and hard for the also for some of the men in this situation because society has made a statement that isn't necessarily accepted in the norms of let's go back to business working culture so I've had quite a few discussions with uh, male leaders who are like 
yeah, it was hard for me to say, and I got not discriminated against. There was some judgment, and I could see it, feel it, and hear it that I was leaving early in inverted commas uh, to go and look after my children, or you know, to the extent of something. Oh, is your wife ill? <laughs> so I think we're also, I think we're also looking at societal uh, stereotypes that we're trying to break, which I think COVID helped also. Thank you, COVID, in terms of actually bringing this subject to the fore. But what else can be done, like you say, what else can be done in organisations so that that becomes the norm? And, and I think, you know, there are pioneers in terms of individual people, but as an organisation, what, what can we do? Well, I think, so yeah, so so going back, I think role modelling this from the very senior leadership yeah. levels, if we can, um, and awareness, spreading awareness that the unconscious bias because if we don't if the, it is by definition unconscious that we have these unconscious bias this unconscious bias that it comes through in the way we communicate and then interpersonally we impact people and we affect them and they come away feeling bad about themselves and guilty and I felt that myself as you have conversations around the needs that you have as a working mum let's say and it's like the narrative is oh no don't worry it's it's fine look we're flexible it's it don't worry about it but ultimately the guilt is there as a working mom that mm. you know essentially internally i need to probably own that a bit more and think i need to stop letting myself feel this guilt yeah mum guilt but <laughs> i think to answer your question it's normalizing these things and that mm. takes time it's not going to happen overnight it's a cultural change it's a cultural transformation that we're going from sort of old mentalities to a newer more transformational mm. way of working and I think we are feeling and experiencing that change in the moment right right now I am part of that change and it's not going to be easy any change agents or anybody that's driving any new ways of working will always be impacted negatively in some way or another and it will mm. be extra pressure um, but with regards to the men's role in all of this I would say that you know I have a really good um work life balance in the sense that, that my husband meets me halfway so he also prioritizes being there for our kids where where we where he can so that takes a bit of the pressure off me mm. but I think that I have a I often talk you know debate with myself whether the pressure I feel to be there as much as I want to be whether that is because I am a mum and intrinsically that's what I want to do or is this a societal pressure that's just been ingrained and I've got kind of an internalized misogyny, if you like, around what's yeah. expected of me as a woman? I think that if I really boil that down, I want to be there for my kids in the capacity that a mother yes. wants to be there. That I do think that having children has taught me that there is something, a bond, there is something there between a mother and a child that is... I don't know if I'd say it's stronger than that between a child and a father. I don't want to offend anybody here, but from my experience... I have felt that my kids need me more than they need their father. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, they're obsessed with me. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why they like me so much. Right? <laughs> they're still young though. How, how young are they? They're still young, two and four. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, two okay. and four. And when they're this young, I, I do really think that the mother play, needs to play more of a key role because that's what they want, you mm -hmm. know, not even what society wants. Tom, my, my husband can be there as, as much as he likes, he, but, but yeah, there are challenges for him as well that, I, for example, when I've asked for flexible working or to consolidate my work week, it's been sort of okayed because I'm a working mum, right? So that's mm. the right thing to do. But when he's asking for the same thing, he has received, oh, but, oh, I'm not sure that we can do that. I'm not sure we can provide mm. that. And you can see the cogs ticking around, well, what's your wife doing? Is she, can she not consolidate her work week? It's like, well, why should we both consolidate our work week so our kids don't have to be in childcare five days a week? Yes. And, and that's our personal choice and decision. Mm. Um. So, yeah, there is definitely something around it being unusual at the moment for men to request these things. Yeah. But I think the more we normalise it, the more we role model this, the more yeah. people around us see this happening. They think, well, actually, maybe I could request something similar and eventually it'll become very, very normal. Yeah. As it is in many organisations, those who are quite forward thinking and progressive are already there. Mm. There are lots of organisations where consolidating your work week is like nothing. It's like everybody yeah. does that. Mm. You know, yeah. where, where it's possible to do so um but yeah there's there's definitely something in the the roles that men and women play in caregiving responsibilities it isn't I don't think it's for me it will never be a hundred percent equal 50, and 50, I don't 50, actually no. want it to be because I think no matter what 
role I might be offered. And I've had situations where I've been you know, essentially offered twice the salary to mm. go and do a job, but then it will be twice the workload as well. So it's not really, that's not really doubling my salary if you're going to double my workload. That's mm. not how I see this. Mm. And I've had to turn those, those jobs down because I don't have the capacity to provide that organization what what they need because I mm. want to be there for my kids it doesn't matter how much money they offer me I don't want to give up my primary yeah. caregiving responsibilities because mm. it means something to me personally it's who mm. I am mm. as a person I'm a mum mm. so um I think there's something in that as well is that we, I don't know if we necessarily mothers all want men and women to be 50 50 in the caregiving side of things I think that organizations need to recognize and acknowledge that that's sometimes the case that mums want to be the one that's most present yeah but I th- and i think we're back to equal opportunities aren't, you? aren't we so if we, yeah. we normalize equal opportunities therefore everyone has their the scope to make a personal choice and and what's right for them and and which model is comfortable for them exactly yeah we have a duty to do that for now for what's happening now but if i look you know your kids are two and four if and it brings me to the generational question of you know what we're pioneering for future generations and the fact that we now have five generations in the workplace you know what do you think that there is cross-generational learning uh that could help or indeed hinder um our need that we have to put in new policies new processes new habits particularly in the workplace i think there's definitely a lot of of benefits of having you know five generations in the workplace 100 percent. i think that the more diversity you know, cognitive diversity yeah. we have in the workplace, yeah. the better we will be as organisations, the more creative, the more yeah. innovative, the better performance we can provide to organisations. And I think, you know, cross mentoring across different generations is really helpful. But again, I think progress depends on people being open minded and having this growth mindset and being willing to see someone else's perspective. Mm. So, you know, again, going back to sort of emotional intelligence, there's there's the emotional intelligence to notice when something is wrong. Then there's empathy needed to make to actually take action on what you've noticed. Mm. I think that goes through all generations. If we want an inclusive work environment, we have to care about other people's experiences in the workplace and take action to try and make it better. Mm. So if we can learn from each other, great. I think what could hinder that is this sense of, well, we've managed until this far without this. And this is the way it's always been and this sort of you know what not wanting to rock the boat or question the status quo and change is always difficult Mm. it's always met with resistance in any case Mm. when it comes down to things like inclusion that are difficult to define yeah it's difficult to measure the impact as well Mm. we're going to have challenges with that 100 percent we will Mm. and i think even with going back to this sort of the, the mother father sharing the workload thing i was Um, My husband was a stay at home dad for the first sort of year and a half of my daughter's life. Mm -hmm. And I was the one that was working and and he wasn't working. And that was something that people found really interesting. You know, if I mentioned that work, wow, really? He's a stay at home dad. Oh God, good for him. eh? He married somebody that's going to let him stay at home. And it's like, "Mm, would you have said that to me if it was the other way around? Probably not. Yeah, of course. It's it's more normalized. It's more common. It's something that you, you see more. Um, so yeah, there's definitely, but but there's a lot of benefits in having those new ways of working coming into the organisation and people who have been their generation seeing this new stuff and maybe thinking, oh, you know, if they're open minded enough, that's that's really interesting and having this sort of learning culture to want to understand more. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think we we have a tendency as human beings to reject what is different, absolutely, um, and what is new, and so it's it's about overcoming that in a way that you'd overcome it for anything else as well, really. Mm-hmm. And what was what was his experience of being a, a stay at home dad in terms of reintegrating uh, his professional life? Well, it was really challenging because we put his career on hold. Essentially, yeah. um, uh, there's a lot of background to this, but we moved. We we lived in Dubai for 13 years. Um, we moved back to the UK um, during COVID because um, Tom was made redundant. The aviation industry where we worked was hit really hard, so he was made redundant. So we both ended up leaving the UAE, came back to the UK. I got a job in in the rail industry um, and Tom was still searching for a job at the time. So it it was, you know, we can't go back into the UK at the moment during COVID with no child care no, available, no. Um, no housing available either, because even like temporary accommodation, Airbnb and things were all shut down. Um, we can't go back to the UK and both of us start working. 
Mm. So how do we go around this? We okay. have to have a situation where I go to work and he stays at home. And we did that for a while because we wanted our daughter to have that sort of um, primary caregiver mm. interaction as well for as much as sort of extended period of time, as much as we could afford. Um, but yeah, he, his career was put on the back burner. It did have an impact on him, I think, from a sort of psychological perspective. Being a man, there's this social narrative mm-hmm. around being the the primary breadwinner, breadwinner and the, right. you know, the person who provides for the family and I think there was you know he's a very strong person and he's um, very self-aware and we have a very good relationship and very good communication but if we didn't have that I think that it could be quite emasculating for him mm-hmm. to have when you have a wife who's it takes a strong character to to be okay with it I think is yeah. what I'm trying to say yeah to go against why the norm. is that though mm. why why have we got that situation why are we putting men in the position that that is weird that they want to be with their kids yeah um, yeah I, I don't think it is it should be that way um but again i i do think we have come a long way i think we can talk negatively about the experiences that we have in right now and the way that there's lots of growth to go there's mm. lots of progress and change to happen but if i look at where we were before covid and where we are oh, now yeah. When it comes to supporting working parents or being inclusive and, you know, even the narrative around neurodivergent people and and how we want to create better Mm. environments for them, it's got to start somewhere. Right. And I think there are people out there doing really great work to try and raise awareness on what we can do differently. So Mm. I think we've come a long way. So we've got to really celebrate that. Yeah, me too. And I, and I think we've got a lot more curiosity, healthy curiosity in organisations for these subjects and what they mean for ways of working, for team mm. dynamics and things like that. I mean, what, what for you is the most transformative thing that leaders can do with their teams or communities to enable the transition to this um, different type of, of workplace? Because I think you have a lot more, people have a lot more awareness. <clears throat> um, it's more tangible. Um, it's more talked about which also brings backlashes like the backlash we're getting on D&I. Um, but there are, I wholly believe in the power of personal agency and collective agency in just proving and trying and testing things that work and things that don't, because you always have things that don't. But, you know, how can we, how, what's the most transformative thing for you that leaders could do if you had to give them a sort of playbook? What would it be? I think it's about putting yourself it's like being humble mm. knowing that you are never going to know everything and put yourself in a position where you are constantly trying to learn and grow and get better every single day with regards to your understanding of what is needed trying things if it doesn't work out get the feedback and try again those sort of continuous improver, improvement loops and I, I mean I've, I've said this I think a big theme of this conversation is that I really believe that building connection with people and relationships with people to understand who's working for you and what do they need and yeah. what are the individual differences and how do they each need different kinds of support and and um and maybe even upskilling you know so i think understanding who's working with you taking the time to have those conversations and building relationships and i think ultimately that comes down to getting the right people into these roles in the first place if we if we recruit people we recruit leaders based on their uh, you know a strong non-technical skills foundation strong emotional intelligence you are going to set your organization up for for success from the start Mm. so if people already naturally have these attributes where they can build relationships with people and connect with people well you you, they're going to continue to do that throughout Mm. you know organizational careers Mm. um But yeah, I think staying updated with what is the new understanding, the new the new awareness around what is needed and what what works, what doesn't work. Mm. I think a really good and this is not a plug, by the way, but a very good platform for that is LinkedIn, that if you're following the right people, the real thought leaders in this space, you don't have to sit down and read books and articles. You're getting snapshots of real life experiences Mm. and information around what works, what doesn't, what's the current narrative around inclusion and mm. even when it comes down to sort of um disabilities in the workplace if you could there are some amazing voices on linkedin that yeah, are talking are. about <clears throat> what you can do you know mm. giving real tangible tools of, of things that people can try and people can do and giving mm. people this uh, you know knowledge around mm. what might be needed so mm. i think that's 
on an individual level, what we can do as leaders is just be informed and take ownership and accountability of remaining informed and and and, and working on our own unconscious bias, yep. um, you know, internally as well. And I think if everybody did that, we'd have a really great cultural transformation, wouldn't we? If everybody did personal personal mm. development mm. work on themselves. Mm. And I think, you know, time is the most sought after resource, of course. And um, which is why things don't get done. Sometimes it's a reality. Sometimes it's an excuse for not wanting to step into a specific space. Um, and, and time is running, but I do have this last question for you. What would your call to action be, Jody, for our listeners around people who want to start impacting their workplace? Would it be to stay on LinkedIn and um, follow, you know, develop themselves personally by following what's going on or would you have another call to action for them? If I'm sat here thinking, mm, I recognize a lot of that conversation, a lot of those feelings, I would like to impact this more in my workplace. What would your call to action be? I think you call, the call to action is get to know, get to know your people, get to mm -hmm. know who your people are, what they need, ask them, have those conversations and understand what they need and then do everything you can to provide them what they've requested for. And that's that's the sort of the accommodations, the flexibility around inclusion. That's what it is. Mm. What do people need on an individual level and try to provide that to them in the background? The, you know, the, the sort of the keeping updated and the knowledge element is just kind of the foundation you need yeah. to know if you're if what you're doing is is current and right and, and what is needed mm. uh, and learning from the, perhaps the mistakes of, of others rather than through your own mistakes. That's probably mm. a better way of putting it. But yeah, I just think having that strong foundation of understanding what people, what is the well-being situation at your mm. organisation? Because I think a lot of time we just don't even know. We're not even yes. measuring no. how people are doing. So mm. when people turn around and say, I resign, you go, wow, I had no idea there was any problems. Like, well, you never asked me. Mm. You never asked me if I was OK or what was going on in the background. So you, you've got to know your people you've got to know yeah. what you're dealing with otherwise you've no you can't even start no I would say in, yeah. in trying to create an inclusive work environment okay and I reckon you've got to also have an open mind in, in acknowledging that everybody will be different as well so there seems to be this tendency to recruit people because we want a more diverse workforce but then when people get there we say oh you're a bit different can you try and be a bit more like everyone else yeah fitting in yeah. well that's not very useful no you know so it's uh there's definitely a, a, a bit around that and and the recruitment strategies that you have as well need to be focused on if you know you need a, a you've got a culture currently and you've got a gap between what you've got and where you want to go you need to think about well what kind of people will help us get to where we want to go and tune your recruitment strategy so you start recruiting people who build the culture you need not the culture you have mm. because if you keep recruiting people based on the current of strategy course. you're going to get more of the same sort of situation of, as you've already got you're not going to grow and, and get better so actually what I would say to leaders is that when you get these this challenge and you know potentially conflicts happening in your teams you think wow this is great because this means people th are thinking differently mm. we're not mm. we're not aligning on everything that we think which is great mm. you know that means that we might be actually doing something a bit different and having opportunities to learn and grow so you know I think that's that's definitely something that I would I'd advise is 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 look out for, you know, wherever you're trying to create psychological safety and you're trying to get people to speak and to share their opinions and their and voice things, you are always going to get conflicts and disagreements. And that's that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, look out for that. OK, so I'm going to leave our listeners with that. So know your people, take the time to know that and actually uh, get excited when you see differences. <laughs> Because that's yeah, not always absolutely. the reaction, is it? And try to define as well, I would say that around these, you know, these generalised cultural narratives that we have around, you know, trying to create cultures of care and things like that, a culture of care and support. And I think we need to define what that is. Yeah. What does that really mean for us? And what kind of behaviours are conducive to that and what are not? And I think that's mm. something that's often missed out, that we expect that everybody understands what care means. Yeah. You know, I think one of the one of the a really uh funny and you know interesting way of putting this um is a, a vision statement by Huel uh, which I think is taken from I think one of the Australian rugby teams which is um I'm going to swear now uh -huh. um, don't be a dick mm -hmm. and I think if we live by the principle of consider everything that you do and how it's going to impact somebody and if you think 
you've been a dick mm. <laughs> don't do that again yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. and if you think you've harmed somebody go and fix the problem like own it be mm. accountable for having you know we, we all make mistakes but it's about taking ownership of that and, and rather than going oh they'll get over it no yeah. go back and restore that relationship restore that trust because going forwards otherwise you you won't you're not it's nothing's going to align you're not going to get along very mm. well i do think mm. that impacts you know collaboration teamwork performance leadership everything so Absolutely. yeah I, I, that really wrong wrong true for me was like you know don't be a dick like yeah just don't just don't be mean be kind be kind yeah yeah and if you're not go and sort it out <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and if someone else isn't being call it out call in it out. conversation as well yeah yeah excellent Jodie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, your stories and everything else. Where where can people interact more with you on these topics? Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm a very active um, member of, of LinkedIn. So, you know, my profile there um, is probably the first port of contact, really. Um, so, yeah, that would be that would be great. I'd love to hear from people if anybody wants to connect or follow. That would be fab. OK, super. And I'll put the link to, Jody, to Jodie's uh, LinkedIn profile in, in the show notes so you can find it easily. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for a great conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me, Susie. Thank you. Thanks. See you. Bye.